Yeah. So, um, hello, everyone, and welcome to um, another LSA CPD. Sounds uh, sounds more and more like a TV host kind of introduction. More. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just for those who are new to the kind of format, uh, we we give speakers kind of around thirty minutes to kind of uh, present an idea or topic, and then we try to give the discussion and Q and A equal billing uh, to that, so uh, the audience can kind of get any key questions or information that they want to know that's pertinent to <coughs> relevant to the subject at hand. Uh, answer and address and hopefully we can have a good conversation as we always have so far um, resulting from that. Uh, today we have Jerry Tate, the Tate of uh, Tate Harmer, a uh, London-based oh. practice. Um, and uh, Jerry will be talking about um, transforming uh, an almost 200 year old piece of infrastructure, uh, uh, Brunel, Brunel's Thames Tunnel, into um, a community asset and the practices role uh, within that process. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jerry and uh, shut up. <laughs> oh, no. Thanks, Jason. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, um, look, uh, Jason, thanks for inviting uh, you know, me here today. Um, it's really great. And, it, and it's uh, very nice to virtually uh, meet you all. Um, you know, we, we, we love the LSA. It's, 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 it's a really great school. We've actually still we've got here Studio Eightfold, who um, uh, we share an office with here, and, and they're all ex LSA as well. So. Um, you know, it's a really sort of good and strong institution. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, I've got a kind of 30 minute slideshow presentation, basically. Um, hope that's OK. And then I think we're going to have some questions afterwards. Um, but just to um, introduce me, really, I'm a partner. So I'm, I'm the Tate and Tate Harmer, like Jason said. Uh, this is us. Uh, we're based in Dalston. Um, so that's me, that's Rory, this is the team. Um, I think actually uh, that's something I stress is that, um, you know, uh, architecture is a sort of team game. Uh, so, you know, everything I'm about to show you is a result of teamwork. And actually a lot of it's done by um, a guy called Lawrence Pinn in our office. That's Lawrence there, just that, you know, but uh, yeah, architecture is a team game, not, not an individual sport. And um, the kind of work we get up to, it kind of sits in the overlap of, um, like community, sustainability, landscape and heritage, basically. Um, and we work for a, a lot of clients uh, like um, the Eden Project, the National Trust, uh, the Scout Association, and of course, the Brunel Museum. Um, so you can see the kind of the kind of thing we get up to. Um, so we've been uh, working with the Brunel Museum since 2013, basically, so quite a long time. And today, I thought I would explain to you um, what Brunel's Thames Tunnel is, uh, basically. It was definitely not designed as a visitor attraction. And then um, take you through our journey of making it into a contemporary museum and, and a community asset. So, so talking about the Thames Tunnel first and then and talking you through how we've worked with the Brunel Museum. So just to give you a quick intro, really, this is the location of the Brunel Museum. So that's it there with the red line around it. And it's a site that's leased from uh, Transport for London, basically. And so you can see that's the Thames on the north there. Um, well, the high station is, is sort of there, basically. So, so, so that's where it is. Um, and the site's composed of two elements, really, uh, which are sort of left over from the construction of the Thames Tunnel. So we've got the engine house, which used to house the pump that um, kind of pumped the tunnel out. And the tunnel shaft, which is which is this thing here, just it poking poking up here, it goes down a lot deeper, and that was what um, helped form the tunnel in the first place. Um, so um, the site is, uh, if you're into this kind of thing, you're probably learning about this stuff. But it's it's Grade Two star listed, but it's also something called a scheduled ancient monument, which is which is really sort of above Grade One. So it's a slight uh, slightly weird heritage status, but it, it's. Um, it's very important. Um, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, uh, the museum's been there since the 70s and it's sort of been occupying the buildings and the grounds. And the site has evolved over the years. So, um, you know, there's artifacts the museum have collected, which they display on the site. Some of them, you can see sort of pumps here. There's some community artwork as well. Um, but the key artifacts really are the buildings and the story of the site. And, you know, as with any site really that evolves over a period of time, some things have just kind of happened. So there are sort of slightly strange level changes, you know, and not every space is sort of fully optimized as it were. 
Um, so you can see this is inside the engine house here. That's the engine house. That's the big, the big flue, um, a sort of view, 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 view down. Um, but uh, what I would say is there is a real magic to the site. So um, it's got a kind of industrial heritage meets verdant nature in the middle of the city. Um, so for example, uh, this is the garden on the lid of the tunnel shaft. Um, so you can see here, you know, people have a lovely kind of beer. It's very nice. So what is the Thames Tunnel and how did it end up here in London? Well, um, it was the first tunnel under a river and the first piece of the first urban underground railway network in the world. So the Thames Tunnel was uh, basically the brainchild of Mark Brunel, who planned it as a way to get under uh, under the Thames, really. So you couldn't build a bridge over the Thames because they're all, it's just full of ships with masts and things. This is sort of in the uh, well, early 1800s. Um, so the idea really, you know, and it took four hours to cross London Bridge at the time. So what Mark wanted to do was build a tunnel under the river, um, which would then have these sort of large ramps that would give carriage access down. So you could take goods under the river and, and back up again. Um, and this is sort of one of the original Brunel drawings of, of, of the rather high end, if you like. So you can see the basic arrangement and the idea. This is the tunnel shaft, uh, which is basically kind of 15 metre diameter brick drum, uh, which is the way to get down to the tunnel. And then this is the tunnel going off here under the river. And that, that's the sump that the, uh, the pump house is sort of pumping out. So every, every you can still hear it today, actually, when you're in the shaft, you can hear this brrr noise every sort of uh, hour or so. And, that, and that's the sump pumping out. So the tunnel shaft is a 15 metre diameter, 15 metre high brick drum. It was built above ground originally and then sunk into the clay banks of the Thames. So it's a sort of pretty incredible thing. I mean, no one had done this before. This is all something that Mark had kind of invented to do actually a tunnel in St. Petersburg. And then he had a very, um, very kind of complicated life, Mark. But at one point he was the chief architect of New York and he built a canal in Canada but then he fell in love with a girl in London. So he moved back to London and came up with this idea of, um, uh, came up with this idea of kind of doing, doing a tunnel under the Thames. Um, uh, so basically a 50 meter high, uh, diameter, 50 meter high, and it was sunk into the banks of the Thames. It got stuck halfway. They had to kind of flood it and keep digging. And then once it was sunk into the banks of the Thames, this is, you know, Mark Brunel's big invention basically it's a thing called the tunneling shield so it's an iron and wooden frame and it's got 32 chambers in it for for men to be in so you can see the men here sort of digging out and basically they they they, they dug a little bit every day um and then pushed along by one brick worth and then someone brickies would then uh make this kind of brick uh brick tunnel behind it so uh, essentially it moves forward inch by inch it's still how tunnels are built today, actually. So, so this is still uh, the concept, really, of all tunneling technology. But no one at that point had done this before ever. Um, and it was because of that, it was supposed to take three years, but actually ended up taking 20. And, you know, it has to be said that the tunnel was you know, a feat of willpower as, as well as engineering. I mean, the fundraising to keep the project going over 20 years was, was immense really and, and, and keeping the show on the road. Uh, and in fact, really Mark, this is Mark on the left here and this is Isambard Kingdom Brunel. It's a sort of very famous photograph of him. Um, uh, basically, Mark got ill and Isambard took over age 19. And, and in many ways, it was the making of Isambard to understand that both the kind of technical delivery of a project and the showmanship required to deliver it are kind of they're both needed really to keep something going so for example here on the right uh, this is the 1827 uh, dinner that they had sort of very famously under un, under the Thames in the kind of half-built tunnel um, and you can see actually here that's the Duke of Wellington but which is sort of quite important fella um, he was the key driver really for fundraising for the tunnel because of course he wanted it to be able to get troops underneath the river you can see in the background here that is the grenadier guards playing so it must have been absolutely deafening um, a week later the tunnel flooded so if it flooded they'd have, they'd have basically killed all the people who were funding the project it's been a bit scary then in 1843 the the tunnel was completed basically um uh, but carriages never went down it they never built the kind of big shafts either side of it um and it was open to pedestrians 
uh, basically. I mean, it's very popular. You know, a million visitors went through the tunnel in the first three months. So that's bigger than the population of London at that point. Um, but it was never really a commercial success. So, you know, you could go down in there and you could pay a penny and you could buy some sort of tent tat. But after 20 years, it started getting a bit seedy. There were some sort of stories about stuff happening in the alcoves. And... Um, in 1869, it was sort of gratefully sold, really, to the East London Train Company. And um, from then on, the, the, the shaft, you can see the shaft here, had a sort of slightly ignoble existence. It was an open vent shaft for steam trains. And um, the Luftwaffe tried to bomb it in 1943, and they realised it was a flood risk for the underground network. So at that point, uh, they put a very, very big, thick lid on it. And then TFL in 2010... Um, put a concrete slab in, basically, which, which separated out the shaft uh, from the overground network when they put the overground in. So that made really then this kind of below ground chamber, uh, which is a key part of the museum. And um, basically, this is the, the, the tunnel shaft when we first visited in 2013. So you can see kind of the soot on the walls. You can see some of the Luftwaffe damage here. And you can see sort of the ghost of the pedestrian staircase, basically, going down the outside of the, uh, the, the shaft. So you can still see where, where people used to go down in 1843. So our first project uh, for the museum was to convert the tunnel shaft into an accessible community performance space, basically. Um, and when we came to the project uh, in 2013, um, access to the space at that point, access to the tunnel shaft, was through something that we were calling kind of the Hobbit Hole, which is this little door here, very low door. It's actually historically really important because um, Isambard Brunel was plucked through it in 1828 and saved um, when, 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 the, when the, um, the shaft flooded up to about here and he was plucked out through, through the door um, and taken to Bristol to recuperate, which is how he ended up in Bristol. Um, and there was also this sort of slightly rickety scaffold stair. So the museum were running community events in it at that point, but, but also it was extremely dangerous. I mean, basically, if there'd been a fire, everybody would have died. So it was really scary. Um, and we were brought into the project by my old company, Grimshaw Architects. Um, so... Nick Grimshaw phoned me up, uh, which was lovely to speak to him. Um, and um, he'd been working with Yorin. So these sketches are by Yorin, basically, uh, of, of Grimshaw, just about how to start thinking about, you know, can we get access into the sinking shaft in a more kind of inclusive way? And our first job really was to take the Grimshaw idea and turn it into a, you know, discreet and realisable project. So um, something also that would fit, uh, we'd, we'd got a grant, a quarter of a million pound grant from Ain Biffa. So we needed something that would kind of fit that budget bracket, basically. Um, so we refined sort of Yorin's original thinking into this concept of a sort of 21st century armature, this kind of like uh, compact staircase, a poke into the space um, uh, and, and uh, really provide all of the functionality the space needed to support the community uses the, the museum wanted to achieve, go, ranging from, um, you know, uh, space for performance with, with stacking chairs here. It would be something that would support the feature and theatrical lighting. It would have the storage element needed for the space, uh, an area for a new bar area, um, hoist for anything we need to get access for. So there's a little sort of hoist area to drop things down. And as best we can, inclusive access, because at that point we didn't have enough money to do um, uh, lift access basically down into the lower space. And we, we also knew that the low lit atmosphere of the space is really important. So um, we took a bit of a cue actually from underground stations and we came up with this idea of a sort of magic thread, a sort of continuous magic thread that would guide you down to the lower level. So as long as you grabbed it at the upper level, it would take you all the way down, no matter what the kind of low lighting levels were. So you can See here, this is the, the, the new staircase element here, that 21st century armature, uh, giving all the functionality for the space, sitting on the um, TFL slab with trains still going underneath it. And that's something really important that this is still a, a this is, remains a live piece of railway infrastructure. Uh, and we had to convince TFL to, to let us do all this work. Um, uh, so you have to get consent from them, which is, which is quite um, difficult, luckily, at this point, the head of trustees was someone called Bryn Bird, who used to be a very famous engineer, or still is, 
of a company called Whitby Bird. So he, he knew a lot of people at TfL, which was very handy. And, you know, it, it, this is also, so it's a scheduled ancient monument, a TfL piece of railway infrastructure, and, and it's a flood risk. Um, and of course, it is also a below ground uh, chamber right by the Thames. So it's, it's very difficult. And in many ways, it's a sort of ship in a bottle problem. So hopefully this movie is going to work. And I'm sort of hoping you can hear some music as well. Let's see if I've got anything in the chat. Can anybody tell yeah. me if you're not hearing it? Is that okay? You're coming through, Jason. Um, so the only damage we were allowed to do to the shaft was um, that doorway you saw there, which was a 1.4 metre by 2 metre door. And everything had to go through this, basically. Um, and let me turn the volume down a little bit. So we, we basically prefabricated this sort of, um, you know, Swiss Army knife stair structure, if you like, uh, so that it all fitted through that door. Um, so, for example, we worked with Iron Designs in Bristol, uh, not sorry, Brighton, God blimey, um, mocked up this door in their factory, and we'd already kind of tested this out before it arrived to site. And it's one of these projects, you know, given the number of different statutory overlaps and complexities of it, uh, and the planning required, it, it, it took two years to plan but only two weeks to build in the end it happened like a rocket so everything you're seeing here happened in a kind of two week period basically i'll just let this movie run out so you can see it see it all coming together oh stopped So uh, this is the uh, completed stair in the space. And you can see that, you know, the majority of the stair, the idea of it really is the majority of the stair retreats into the space. So it's not something that's kind of really visually dominant. You can still read this sort of rich pattern of history in the walls. You know, you can, you can just see the bits that are highlighted really are the bits that help you navigate up and down from this new entrance door in the top here, uh, this platform at the top, with an accessible viewing point here, and then you kind of processional route down, and this is the slab at the bottom. Um, and, you know, we've just kind of essentially done as little as possible to the space so that you can read the history in the walls. So, um, for example, when we cut the hole uh, in the shaft, we, um, <laughs> it turns out we didn't need any structure at all because it was entirely solid brick, uh, which actually, Nobody quite knew. Weirdly, there were sort of three or four different versions of um, of of, of Brunel's drawings, which one of them showed a cavity. So we didn't know what we were going to find. It didn't need any support, um, but it meant that you could kind of understand how 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 the shaft was constructed. And and in fact, Brimbo, Brimbird wrote a paper on it after we cut up the, the, the door in the wall uh, about how the shaft was constructed because we did things like find a chain in it, sort of certain amounts of reinforcement. And of course, uh, you know, once we finished uh, making the space into a kind of performance and event space, we had to have a big party to test it out. So, uh, so this is us here um, having a party, testing the sound system and testing the capacity of the staircase. Very important to do that. Check the bar works, all that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, it, it's great. It's very successful as a space. Obviously, at the moment, it's not great because um, it can't be rented out. But, um, you know. Uh, available for hire if anybody wants to have a party there. I think the Brunel Museum run a sort of Robin Hood, um, uh, Robin Hood uh, system for how much they charge people to use it. And, you know, rich people pay more money, basically. And after we completed this first phase for the museum, um, we we then since then really have been working with them on a sort of larger uh, reinvention of the, the wider site, and we helped them get. Um, 
a Heritage Fund grant um, about uh, a couple of years ago now, or a year and a half ago, which is a, a, a £2 million capital grant to transform the museum, um, bring it into the 21st century and, and make it into a real community asset. So the project touches on um, all the key kind of remaining elements of the museum that we hadn't really addressed in phase one. So creating an area for interpretation in the engine house, um, uh, taking ticketing admin and toilets out and, and making this sort of new entrance pavilion so that we have a sort of modern piece of structure which does uh, all the gubbins you need for a museum without affecting the heritage structure. And also making a coherent museum and community experience. So really sort of bringing everything together. At the moment, it's a bit ad hoc about where do you arrive and what do you do next sort of thing. This is the section, by the way, you can see here, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the overall section. So that's the engine house there. That's the, the tunnel shaft. And, and that's the, um, uh, basically the, the, the train system below where the overground goes. Um, so obviously, once you get kind of larger scale project like this, you need a bigger team. So this is them here, basically, this is all the team. Um, again, you know, this teamwork thing, uh, one of the things I'd really stress is that we're 50-50 with Purcell as architects on, on this part of the project. So although we are the lead designers, they are the heritage architects, and we've each taken different bits of the project to sort of lead, if you like. So we're helping each other, but working together. So it's just back to that early point about teamwork, you know, which is um, something actually I think the LSA is really good at, um, in truth. Um, and there are four kind of key drivers to the um, reinvented project, really. The first is that the museum uh, recently, about two and a half years ago, acquired the drawings, the original drawings of the Thames Tunnel. And they're amazing original drawings. Um, uh, a lot of them by Brunel, uh, Mark or Isambard, basically. Uh, they're sort of part sales drawings. So they did them to sort of persuade people it was all a good idea, part record of what they built. And um, uh, which is there, you can see there's, there's a record here of, um, uh, this is Isambard getting sent down in a, in a diving bell to, uh, by, by Mark, who's up here to, to, on a boat to, to fix something in the tunnel. Um, uh, and, and also, obviously, about design. So they're obviously them designing them through drawings as well. So it's a bit of both, which makes it hard to know what they actually built, of course, in the end. But it means that the museum finally has sort of content to build a display around. Um, the second key driver is inclusive access. So you can see on this section here, we can see here there's sort of lots of different level changes across the site. And you can see here on this section diagram, there are six publicly accessible levels on the site and, and um, this project will create access for all of them basically so you can see here we've got level access to the garden we've got lifts down to every level uh, we're getting rid of one of the levels altogether um, so, so that's that's really important about inclusive access the third key driver was creating something that's genuinely for the community so the museum over the years has really become a hub both for the local community and to some extent, of course, also the wider engineering community. Um, and we held um, as many public consultation events as we could under the circumstances, because obviously it's sort of locked down. Um, um, so this is us, for example, at our open house, September, 2020. Um, and we had some events inside the shaft as well. And you can see here uh, as a volunteer pretending to be Prudell. <laughs> um, and we also did a lot of Zoom meetings as well. To, to talk to people and I have to say the consultation you know genuinely informed the project we, we, we moved the pavilion for example because of it um, we included and then excluded a cafe after comments um, we did a lot of brief changes with storage lots of things and one of the key things that made us realize that was that we had to cater for four different types of community really and and not not just one so so there are Museum. So each of these is a sort of functional diagram about um, how people can use the space and they all sort of overlap. So we've got museum visitors, we've got school visitors, um, we've got the local community who um, will be using, uh, actually there's something we're keeping open, for example, which is the Northern Plaza here, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that open. Um, and then there's also events at the museum as well. So there's things like, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Midnight Apothecary, but they have a kind of cocktail night in the garden every, every Friday and Saturday night. And they also have a lot of events happening in the tunnel shaft. Um, 
And then the fourth and final kind of key driver was, of course, the heritage of the site. So um, this is the uh, heritage assessment by Purcell. Um, purple here is basically very high. So you can see that things that are very high are, are effectively kind of the main fabric of the structures, if you like. That, 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 that's the kind of key asset of the heart of the site. Um, and the strategy we developed with Purcell was to build on the original phase one concept of this sort of 21st century armature and you know strip away really everything from the existing heritage structures and then only put back um these sort of free standing uh free standing elements really which 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 helped with the functionality of this space but had kind of minimal impact on the actual historic fabric itself so you can see here there's an insert into the engine house to help with interpretation and that's our new pavilion that's the uh, existing um, uh, staircase that we did as part of phase one. Um, and just to show you sort of how that translates then into design, uh, these are concept sketches uh, from Purcell looking at how to introduce new access and interpretation um, into the engine house. It's all about how to kind of carefully insert, uh, you know, this new armature into the space. So working with um, ingenuity, structural engineers, um, uh, we designed a sort of new floor element in the space, which is a freestanding independent tabletop. Uh, it's, it's just sort of restrained very minimally off the, off the kind of historic fabric structure, uh, uh, historic fabric of the structure. Um, then with uh, the display elements being things that are just um, taken off that main central table. And it also translates into things like a minimal servicing strategy. So for example, we're working here with Atelier 10 um, on a natural ventilation heat recovery system strategy. So combined with the building's thermal mass, uh, we can create the right climate conditions for the exhibition without a whole load of kind of ductwork and kit in the space. So again, it's a very minimal um, touch uh, concept. So um, these are uh, actually by John Redman, the exhibition designers. The, these are views of sort of the interpretation inside the engine house. Uh, so you can see here, that's the new tabletop and staircase and lift. And this here is all about um, uh, the tunnel shaft itself with a sort of temporary exhibition area up here, which will change and talk about um, uh, developments and engineering. And on, on the other side, it'll all be about the, the tunnel at the lower level, um, the Brunel's, on the mezzanine level and then their impact on the modern world and how important that was on the upper level. All integrated with these sort of new watercolors as well. Um, and then in terms of then the entrance pavilion, which is this gray thing here. Um, so Tate Harbour led this process more, although we were collaboratively working um, uh, with Purcell all the way through. Uh, and I've got to say, this is really in many ways an iterative design process through modeling. So there are many, many different versions to get to this sort of final model. And the, you know, the reason for that in lots of ways was because it was sort of a quite a picturesque design process um, in, in, in sort of a broad definition of the sense that we were, we were designing uh, in a pictorial way because we were really trying to maintain um, on this south side of the site, two key heritage views in, you can see these views here, of the kind of primary structures. So these were identified by Purcell, uh, these two views in, 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 in their heritage assessment as being really important. So the building kind of uh, basically squeezes between those on the one hand. And then actually on the other hand, then also the building is a um, panopticon. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a panopticon, but it's something that Jeremy Bentham invented actually in truth for prison design. So, <laughs> but it's um, essentially the, the, the pavilion is designed so that one person can uh, operate the museum from a single point on the site and can kind of see all the key entry points, uh, if you like, without, without moving. This is, this is that key location there, basically. And of course, um, we're really keen to tie into the materiality of the site. So uh, we want to, um, for the pavilion, use again, you know, quite tough um, industrial sort of materials like a patinated bronze cladding um, for the outside of the pavilion here, um, keeping a lot of the garden 
and the nature. Uh, so that's a community comment. Originally, the pavilion was more to the right, actually. We moved it along to the left so that we could maintain the garden. And, and this monkey puzzle tree was actually from Brunel's garden um, uh, in Bristol. So there you go. Um, and um, then the entrance is denoted by um, glazed ceramic tiles from Darwin Terracotta up in Doncaster. Um, so uh, the thinking behind that is if you look at a lot of transport infrastructure in, in London, um, essentially ceramic tiles kind of donate the entrance, if that makes sense. So, um, uh, you know, that's something we, we, we're reusing here. So uh, you can see this is a, a uh, the final slide, you'll be relieved to know, this is a, a, a rendered image um, showing the new entrance to the museum. Um, see here, that's the Darwin terracotta ceramic frontage with, uh, you know, this sort of uh, meeting space at the front. Um, and the stars of the show, the engine house and the tunnel shaft are still clearly the main events on the site. You know, they're, 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 they're definitely kind of the dominant elements. And this pavilion is just, again, a sort of uh, the minimal 21st century intervention to help make the site. Uh, work. So that is the 200-year-old um, Brunel's Thames Tunnel, Mark and Isambard Brunel, um, and how we worked with the Brunel Museum for the last seven years to turn it into an accessible museum and community asset. So the project should finish in early 2023, but um, the museum is open now. So, you know, uh, when uh, lockdown ends please do visit the museum i think they could do with some visitors at the moment so uh, uh right that's that so thank you very much are there thank any questions <laughs> well, thank you very much Lee. that was fascinating um if people want to put questions into the chat i can read them out or if you're feeling extremely confident um you'd be more than welcome to unmute yourself and uh, ask jerry a question um as always, I've got uh, millions of questions, so I'll I always like, uh, kick things off while people formulate some questions mm. in their head. Brilliant. Um, you mentioned that kind of consultation moved the project. I was wondering if you could expand on what that process looked like in a bit more detail. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, so it's it's uh, yeah, multimedia kind of right. So so there's loads and loads of different things that we've done. We've um, uh, we have met a lot of the community groups that we could identify basically. So we've had Zoom chats with, uh, in, in this situation, of course, we've had Zoom chats with every community group. Uh, we, we had someone working with us called Fiona King, who was a consultation specialist. So actually she tracked down all the different community groups who we had Zoom calls with. Uh, we also had sort of um, open forum events, um, which actually uh, was sort of slightly less successful on Zoom, if I'm being honest, but mm. the open forum events we had physically were really good. Um, we had a website up and running you could put comments onto uh, and we had a sort of Facebook page and there's a Twitter campaign. So um, it's sort of as many different things we could do as possible to speak to different kind of community stakeholders to get as much input as we can. The truth is if nobody um, uses the museum, it will fail. So, <laughs> so we had, a, for example, at one point, our, our, our pavilion was sitting on top of the, the garden a bit more and everyone wanted us to move it off so we did you know and it's really important mm -hmm. uh, i've got a question from bob which i'll read out yeah great um can you tell us a bit more about how the heat recovery ventilation system works i'm interested in how fresh and distributed without uh the use of ducts yeah. yeah yeah okay so it's um well it's essentially it, it it's a louvered chimney so um uh, air blows across it um, so we've got vents at a lower level. So there's vents in the doors and um, vents at sort of slightly lower levels of the walls and that lets air in, but those vents can open and shut as required. So it is monitored. There's a sort of monitoring system uh, working it. And then at the higher level, we've only got one actually, uh, but we have one sort of little chimney element, which has got louvers in it, which again could be open and shut. And as the wind blows across it, it draws air through, but the really, um, uh, the really important thing it does is it's got a heat exchanger um, in inside it, basically, so that um, as the uh, air is taken through, there is air that also goes in, if you like, but that has its, uh, it doesn't lose its heat. So um, it's not a complete MVHR system. It's not a sealed box. Um, mm. That's not something we can do with this structure, basically. That's a different thing. That's passive house, by the way. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Cool. Got a, <laughs> got a question from Alex who asks, what was the reasoning um, from the community from the community to object to a cafe space? 
All right. Yeah, that's really <laughs> well. It's interesting because so we so there is an idea to do a cafe. So this is this is this is phase two. There is a phase three basically, and the phase three is to put a cafe onto that um, northern plaza basically, where where that's that's the the, the Brunel Museum actually have got the lease for that, but they're mm -hmm. not inside the paywall. They're keeping it as a publicly accessible space, but kind of Brunel themed, if you like. Um, so in the future, we'd like to have a cafe. On that on that public plaza now when we spoke to the community at first um we they all said oh no but we want a cafe now kind of thing so we put a cafe into the pavilion the entrance pavilion the entrance pavilion got a bit bigger uh used a bit of the garden up and then we had a consultation event where they all said they didn't like the cafe there and they prefer it on the northern side mm -hmm. so actually now we've 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 taken that cafe out just to keep the project you know clearly doing kind of one thing which is making the museum work and we we're um, uh, looking for grant funding to build a cafe on the Northern Plaza, basically. So, so that's the story of the community in the cafe. But uh, we, it really is, in many ways, a community-led project. You know, we, our, our, our brief has been informed by what the feedback we've been given. Sure. Um, it, I was going to say, how, for you know, over the course of seven years, how has your role as the architect changed throughout that process? If it has, like, is that? Um, uh, I think that. Um, We've just, I mean, I think really as it's gone on, we've ended up coordinating more and more people in truth, because this is one of those sites where, um, you know, the, the, the amount we, we obviously we design stuff, we're architects when I mean, we do drawings and things, but actually a lot of this site is, is coordination really, you know, there's Transport for London and there's Historic England and then there's Southwark Council and then there's the community and then there's the Environment Agency and there's all these sort of overlapping um, people and then because of that then there's all these overlapping kind of team members that you need to, to make it all work so um, I would say that the longer we've been on the project the more our kind of the more embedded we've got in terms of um, the the octopus that coordinates everything to help things happen if that makes sense yeah <laughs> that, that, that's kind of why this, this project I think is very pertinent to our, our network as well because there's <clears> it's kind of a skill set which architects are going to need to learn quickly over time particularly moving forward as kind of collaborative practice becomes more and more to the phrase yeah uh, i yeah i think i mean just to comment on that is yeah i think people think that you know the creative bit of architecture is when you're sitting down with a big pen sort of thing but yeah. um like the the creative bit of architecture well we think is is making a building basically or or making something making a project let's let's say that mm -hmm. and um you know everything that helps that happen be it doing the drawing with a big pen or a door schedule or speaking to the community, you know, that is all part of the same creative process, basically. Um, and uh, I think actually the LSA, yeah. like you say, Jason, the LSA is particularly good, I think, at, at understanding that, I have to say. So, yeah. I've got another quick, a few more questions here, I read out. Um, yeah. Sasha asks, what was the biggest challenge collaborating with others on such a sensitive site? Sorry, I didn't mean Sasha, to steal your thunder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was the biggest challenge? Um, so, uh, I th well, I th I th the truth is, um, the biggest challenge with that site is getting conflicting demands of different people to uh, link up, if that makes sense. So getting uh, the museum's brief, uh, what the community would like to achieve, uh, the flood risk of the Environment Agency, the requirements of Transport for London. Um, the, 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 the truth is that, that getting all that stuff to line up is, is, is quite tricky. Um, the heritage is an interesting one, though, because um, uh, I think specifically on the heritage, it, it's not the kind of heritage which you uh, imagine heritage is. You know, I mean, it's it's not like a sort of Robert Adam House or something, and it's not about detailing. It's it's quite broad-shouldered stuff, but it's incredibly sensitive because it's literally Isambard's first project. So, um, you know, making a hole in any of those walls, for example. Is, is a big big deal and uh we've only ever made one doorway in the whole yeah in, in, ever kind of thing <laughs> and we're not even making doorways for the reinvented project i mean that that's something that we're reusing doorways that already exist mm -hmm. so I, i'd say that when the heritage is the fabric that's tough basically yeah <laughs> i've got another question from henna who asks uh, did you and the firm initially aspire to do more with the underground development what challenges did you face in building the staircase? Yeah, so um, we originally planned on heating the space, actually. So, in, in, in we still sort of are planning that. So, but um, it's it's 
it, it, in lots of ways, it's quite a steady state because it's underground and actually it, it never goes that cold and it never goes that hot. But we had planned on putting underfloor heating in at one point and we actually still can. We've allowed for that. Um, and and then from that, having this kind of raised floor that would allow um, dance productions to happen there. So it's quite hard for dance to happen on a concrete slab, basically. And the reason it hasn't happened at the moment um, is, is partly money, but also partly that we, we've actually started doing a, um, a research project on the, the pattern of soot on the walls. We're not quite sure what happens if we heat the shaft up and if everything will start falling off the walls, basically. Um, so we need to do a bit of a, well, we're in the middle of doing a research project to find out if that might happen because it, it's a really important part of the space because that, that's literally the history written, written on the walls. Cool. Um, I want to kind of rewind to the, the very start of the project and what was it that the, the clients rather, um, uh, what, what, are they, what parts of your vision did they particularly enjoy? Like, were there parts that were left out that you thought maybe, uh, I'm murdering this question horribly, apologies. <laughs> um, think, have to think. Um, yeah, I kind of, what, what parts of your vision did the kind of client latch on and kind of take and run with? And uh, mm. what, what have you learned from that as a process in kind of future projects? Um, actually, I, I have to say that the client, at that point, the client has shifted over, over the years because this is the thing about working with museums that what happens is the, the trustee board changes as you go. So, so um, but um, at the moment, the, the, the person who's kind of in charge of the trustee board is, is a fantastic person called Jane Stancliffe, who is um, uh, super experienced in heritage. When we started, it was Bryn Bird, who um, he's, he's not, he's very good on Brunel. I mean, I think he's probably the UK's expert on Mark Brunel, actually, interestingly. Um, but he's not from a heritage background, he's from an engineering background. And he was very much about pushing the project on. And actually Bryn was very interventionist about what he wanted to do. He wanted to achieve a lot more. And originally we were planning on sort of, you know, below ground toilets and, you know, lifts that went inside, uh, outside the shaft and we're gonna dig it down. And, you know, it's very hard to scare Bryn with engineering. Um, Actually, that, that's sort of one of the interesting things is as the project has kind of gone on, it's sort of self-evolved into the possible, if that makes sense. So, you know, things just get edited out because they're so hard or they're so expensive or they're difficult to achieve, to achieve from a heritage point of view. Um, and you're left with sort of the essence of the project, you know. So um, weirdly, the project is kind of self-edited as we've gone, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned kind of uh, that you, you identified some of the magic to the site and beyond kind of community consultation was was there like an internal method for for achieving that uh within your practice um i, I will yeah well i i don't think we've got a formal one as such you know i don't know i mean like we do have design reviews you know um but um no i think you know the, the truth is that it's a pretty magical corner of mm -hmm. um of london so i, I really recommend if if you haven't been there everybody you know to, to go and visit if you can i think it's uh six pounds to get in or something you know I mean, it's not a huge amount and um uh it's a pretty magical corner of london and, and i think it's something that um you know when we got introduced to the project it was by um my old boss nick grimshaw who was just really clear about what was great about it so we already had this kind of intro into the project to understand what was great and, and i think we're just aware that um you know, and it's not just heritage character, it's like that charm. We don't want to flatten out that charm through our kind of modernization process, if you, if you know what I mean. I mean, there's no point making it a sort of fully accessible, you know, uh, all singing, all dancing museum, which is a white box, for example. I mean, that, that, would, that would be like the worst thing. So it's, it's um, I think our watchword really is understanding what the essence of the site is. And again, it's back to the self-editing thing. You know, the truth is the least we can do here, the better, you know, if we could make it all happen with nothing, that'd be the best outcome, but we have to do something. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, question from Peter who asks, uh, is there a heritage presence to the north of the site? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question, Peter. Um, so physically, the answer to that is no. Um, because for some reason, best known to um, uh, whoever was in charge of that tunnel, um, they've uh, dug down at the tunnel, put a massive concrete slab in and, and then filled it back in again. And that, that northern plaza now is raised up to just above the flood level. So I think it is the refuge for the local area, which is where you stand when you get flooded out. Um, so it's been kind of wiped clean, 
basically in a sort of in the 70s it was wiped clean of heritage which is a bit frustrating um there is actually um evidence on maps of there being workshops there um and the there's also uh, evidence uh, that the original entrance, the pedestrian entrance, was on that northern frontage in a kind of like weird looking classical portico, interestingly. Um, so, so there is sort of physically there was stuff there. Um, uh, and of course, also, you know, there's no evidence of the tunnels at that upper level as well. So, so you can't really tell where the tunnels go. So physically, there is a history to it. Um, uh, or, or, you know, that there, there are recordings of the history, but physically that's all been wiped. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, I guess one of the key things, one of the reasons like, I was so keen for this project to be explained by you was not only kind of the seven year process of you uh, being there on what was relatively quite a small project and um, achieving quite a lot to get out of it. Yeah. So like the sum, the, the whole part is much more greater than the sum, right? Um, I, was, I was wondering kind of what your role in the legacy of the project is as well. Like how, when will you kind of step away as architects or within or just in, you know in, in terms of engaging yeah yeah well that, no, that's an interesting question i mean so I, I guess on the one hand we've still got a phase three lined up if that makes sense so so um we we don't frankly have enough money really to to, to do everything we're planning on doing so there's a sort of framework within which we're working and, and even when this project is done we'll only really be kind of two-thirds of the way through that framework and we'll work with the museum to help them get funding for that hopefully sort of final third phase um beyond that um we haven't really thought to be perfectly honest uh but you know we, it is one of those things where we've got a sort of similar relationship with the eden project i have to say where you if you've worked with someone for so long um you become the person that they phone up when they've got a problem and um you know for for that becomes your sort of role and it's difficult because it's sort of you know architects are project-based people quite often and, and you know we are set up as a project-based organization mm -hmm. so we only have i'd say we only work with the eden project and the brunel museum as sort of um you know constant repeaters if you like who are always contacting us about things but it's a sort of interesting mode of operation it's like being a gp um i wonder if there's a role for a sort of architect gps you know um, mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, because that's an aspect I'm particularly interested in. Is like, is there any, any kind of lessons from this project which you've taken forward into other other projects and are you know, similar projects to um, ongoing consultations, essentially, which are going for seven years? Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess things that we've taken forward. I mean, I guess from a design point of view, you know, it's given us an attitude to heritage, which is which is useful for us. A lot of our work is heritage, and it's um, uh, given us sort of, you know. A, a framework if you like in which in which how we deal with heritage which is basically do as little as possible yeah. <laughs> um that's, that's that's one thing i think the second thing is it has really you know strengthened our abilities in terms of a kind of collaborative design process you know it's it's not a very ego driven project this one you know like you, you, if you think about if we could do nothing that would be, be better than doing anything really if you just wave one to make it all work so um uh this sort of non-ego driven collaborative design process, I think, is something that clients actually quite want, basically. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I and mean, I don't think that um I'd love to say we're like a signature practice, like a real cool house or something, but like we're we're not, right? Like what we do is we do a really good collaborative design process where we bring conflicting demands together and we deliver something. And and actually, um, there's a fair chunk of projects where where that is the brief, basically. So uh, yeah. And is that kind of a brief which you kind of uh, encourage clients to have as well? Because I think that is going to be the way forward which many architects are going to have to practice as mm. more and more stakeholders come into the game. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if that if that's something you're promoting to clients now about as a, as a, as a mode of practice. I think it's something that we promote to clients as sort of like, you know, we understand how to go through this process to help you deliver. Yeah. Um, but the so, I mean, I'd say that 40 percent 50 percent maybe of our clients are charities basically mm -hmm. so when you've got a charity you you inevitably have a really complicated client setup because you've got um the people who kind of run the charity and work in it you've got the the trustees who who uh you know are quite a wide range of people normally and you've got um the community 
uh, normally, who are the people actually using that charity. And then beyond that, then there's all the sort of statutory stakeholders. And, you know, if it's a school, there's the sort of um, um, safeguarding issues as well. So for a lot of our clients, like the default is that they're, they're, they're actually quite complicated. It's not, you know, a person who wants a building, basically, which, which you know, is sort of the classic kind of, you know, uh, I want a skyscraper kind of thing. It's it's it, it's more that there's a there's a sort of unformed problem that this charity has, and we need to deliver it for them. So, um, yeah, let's answer the question. All right, yeah. I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, uh, given your kind of your practice's size as well, how do you manage that from a resourcing perspective as well? Yeah, do you mean big or small? Sorry, we're not very big. We're only eight. That's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, that's yeah. What I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. No. I, well, I think that's it. I mean, I think the problem with um, I think, you know, being brutal about it is people understand when they're paying for a drawing, but they don't understand when they're paying for a process, if that makes sense, yeah. for, especially for architects. You know, for some reason, for lawyers, time is money. But with architects, that's not the case. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think the trick is to try and uh, package um, the process up into understandable deliverables, if I'm being honest. So we always do things like um, stage reports. So we always do a stage two report or a stage three report. We, we never don't do those because it's a way for us to package up all of that collaborative thinking into one, you know, 200 mm. page document we can give them and, and then they understand what they've paid for, if you see what I mean. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing to say is that managing that process is about translating the process into a deliverable. Um, that's one thing um yeah god practice of this size and not that stuff i mean I, I, you know the trouble the trouble the practice of this size if you really want to know is that we've got on the one hand we're delivering a 12 million pound building in new york which is lovely you know and we're also doing um 300k eco houses for people because we love doing those as well and, and and that scale kind of you know range is mental yeah, it is. <laughs> and yes. uh yeah. no. I don't envy you in terms of managing <laughs> all of that. Um, uh, God, I did have another question, but I was going to say, if anyone else has any other questions, I, I see we're kind of just approaching the last kind of three, four minutes of this. So yeah. if it's always, I do encourage everyone to kind of unmute maybe and uh, put a question, maybe have a bit more of a dialogue, but or I guess put it in the chat. But until <laughs> then, I get what, well, what you touched upon there was actually really per pertinent with regards to how as, as architects, you're selling a process to clients rather than a product. And I think hopefully that's what people in this audience are gonna take away from it as well. I, I, is there, do you have an ideal which you're, which you're kind of moving towards in that regard? Like, okay, this is what we wanna do, provide or? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we're trying to develop more in the practice at the moment, something we're aspiring to is sort of systematizing it a bit more, to be honest with you. So um, having a kind of alternative checklist to the, to the job book checklist, really, where, where these are the things that, uh, you know, there's things that you're supposed to do as you're designing a project and that the sort of RBA structure. But what is our kind of overlay onto that, if you like, both from, um, you know, a community engagement point of view, um, a kind of a collaborative point of view and, and a sustainability point of view. So it's, I think, and, and writing it down as well. So it's something that, you know, everybody understands this is, this is kind of what we do. So um, yeah, we've got kind of emerging thinking, but um, we haven't, we haven't kind of got there yet as a practice, but certainly that's where we'd like to get to Jason. Yeah. I have a question from Ming. Um, can you expand more on the process for managing a collaborative design process? <laughs> consultants. Yeah. Um, so the few things I'd say, so, so um, regular meetings, that's one thing. So meeting every two weeks, that's really important. Um, uh, red pen, every drawing you get sent. So every drawing you get sent, um, make sure you've gone through it and, and that you understand it. If you don't understand it, it's probably wrong. Um, and uh, make sure you just communicate with people. A lot of phone calls are better than emails, by the way. That's one thing. So if you want to persuade someone of anything, phoning them up is more important. But um, we also try and have socials if we can with, with, with you know, the wider team and the design team as much as possible so that we kind of get to know each other. Um, but it's, 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 it's literally a team game. It's like a football team. You know, the more you can get on as a team, the better things will go as a, as a process, really. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and a question from Hina. Uh, what was it like collaborating with TfL? I can imagine it was uh, quite hard to convince them to develop the underground space. Uh, yeah, interestingly, so uh, Bryn 
uh, was basically best friends with the chief exec uh, CEO person, whoever that was at TFL at the time. So, yeah. so, so kind of at a senior level, they had been convinced of it. Um, but, um, and actually they were incredibly cooperative. So there's a guy called Amjad who we worked a lot with at TFL, who was just brilliant um, and was responding to our queries within, within two, three hours. The response time can be six weeks. That's their statutory response time, by the way. So that just shows you how quick uh, yeah. it was going. Even with that, you know, it was an uphill struggle persuading them to let us put a staircase on top of a slab, uh, which trains are going under, by the way. <laughs> that was, uh, that yeah. was tough. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I can certainly imagine. Um, uh, I'm slightly conscious of time, particularly because I know that I've got something in students starting at two. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Okay. But if anyone has any other questions, kind of shoot, drop me or uh, Jerry an email. I can hopefully... Uh, continue the conversation but I just wanted to say uh, thank you Jerry one for your passion in the history of the Saiton project <laughs> incredibly infectious and it was uh, fascinating to learn about how you manage so many constraints usually uh, well constraints always lead to a good project in architecture but this was so many sometimes you wonder but it did it, as as always with, with your practice it, it turned out exceptionally well so I want to thank you once again and thank you for everyone uh, to attending um, mm -hmm. we do have a lot more CBDs coming up this month and beyond so do do stay tuned Great. Thank you, Jason. And lovely to see you all, LSA. It's great. Great to catch up. Brilliant. All right. Take Thanks. care then. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.